iOS 26 is finally available to everyone, you can try it for yourself now, but while there's a lot of noise around the design changes, I want to talk about features that you'll actually use. Some of them, for example, are cold screening, the new maps or adaptive battery, which hopefully this one will save your iPhone from dying at 3pm. But all of the new features make the experience a lot better, so that's why in this video we'll cover the features that you'll actually use, performance and battery life of the public beta, as well as the new liquid glass design iOS 26 introduces a sort of a battery intelligence, if you will, where it tracks and shows your daily average use. So when adaptive battery is turned on, your iPhone learns your daily use and charge patterns and then adapts to them. For example, it will stop the background refresh for apps that you've exceeded your usual use because most likely you won't be needing them anymore that day. It also slows high demand draining apps down to make sure that you don't exceed your average battery usage, that way you can have some battery left by the time you usually charge your phone. I've also noticed that turn low power mode on if your battery is draining way too fast, just to make sure that it will last you throughout the day. And if you've been using less battery than usual, it will completely ignore low power mode. Which I find genius, especially on the Pro model iPhones, where you don't really want low power mode to kick in anyway, because it turns off all of the display features of the Pro models, like always on display and high refresh rate. So theoretically, you don't have to worry about battery life whatsoever anymore. The iPhone will do everything automatically for you in order not to die before you'll plug it in at your usual time. The next feature fixes an issue I guarantee almost everybody had. That's why the snooze and stop buttons are now way bigger and properly color-coded too, unlike before where you would confuse snooze and stop from your timer and alarm, which wasn't very cool. But what is cool is that you can also finally select an interval for the snooze button, whereas previously it was always 8 minutes, and now you can set it from 1 to 15 minutes. Beyond that, I think you would do more harm than good anyway. Moving to the lock screen, there's lots of new useful changes, like the widgets on the bottom for example, which you can simply drag them down or you could also expand the clock and they will automatically fall down. I find them a lot cleaner and more useful at the bottom since you can actually reach them and they don't clutter your wallpaper anymore. Even better, you can now change your wallpaper from the current lock screen without having to recreate it from scratch anymore. And if you want to, you can make it into a 3D animated one. But I find that it gets pretty distracting. and it probably has negative effects on your battery life too. Besides, you only see your lock screen for a split second, so I don't really see a use case for it, but you might like it. The home screen has also changed. There's new customization options like the clear icons, both in light and dark mode, and you can also set them independently from the iOS theme. This actually unifies the home screen pretty neat, especially if you have a matching wallpaper. In my opinion, it's much better than the visual mess the standard icons are, but I find that the dark clear icons look the best, though so if you want to tin them, you really have to use the light mode for this. However, I wish we could have something more like this. In iMessage, you can now set custom chat background wallpapers, create polls and group threads, and toggle real-time translation. Also, Apple Intelligence now sorts unknown messages the moment they hit your inbox, so spam never gets delivered to your main feed anymore, which is pretty cool. The same also goes for unknown numbers. They end up in the new spam folder, but they also trigger a on-device screening that shows a live transcript of what the caller is saying before it even starts ringing, so you can decide whether to pick up the phone or block the number entirely without even having to receive the call. Also, your iPhone can now stay on hold if you don't feel like it. It will notify you once the caller is back on the phone again. Oh, and by the way, live translation also works with FaceTime and video calls, but it takes some time. Apple Music has also got quite a few updates, namely a feature called Audio Mix, which basically works like a DJ, mixing your songs in real time to create a seamless transition into the next song. It works really good. But not for me, and maybe not for you. I find that if you listen to different genres on shuffle, it's quite intrusive, sometimes even skipping half of the next song, but if you're listening to the same genre, it does work wonders. Also, lyrics have now live translation with pronunciation guides underneath, so if you're a karaoke fan, that's a feature for you. Oh, and the lock screen got updated too. But while we're at music, the AirPods have got some updates too. They now sound a lot better when recording voice messages or calling, so you don't have to disconnect them just to record the voice message anymore, like if you did that too. The Photos app brought back the tap navigations from iOS 17, so your recents, favorites, deleted, hidden, basically whatever option you want are a single type away. And the 3D effect from the lock screen can also be created in the Photos app. 
with any photo, no matter whether it was taken on an iPhone or not. Moving to settings, the camera now has a toggle that once activated will remind you to clean your camera lens if it's smudged or hazy. Also, the whole UI has been overly simplified, though I barely call this a feature. It's rather an inconvenience, especially since you can't toggle certain modes on or off anymore. But what do I know? Our designers are advanced photographers. Mm -hmm. Safari is now edge to edge, but you can also change that in the settings if you want more controls. And now you can even use ChatGPT as your primary search engine. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but at least you get the option. The maps now remember your most visited spots by default and sorts them to the time you usually drive to them, and then suggest the quickest ways to get there, accounting for traffic and whatnot, without you having to input anything. It just works, or so Apple says. Reminders are now much easier to create. You can just tap on a custom set widget or map it to the action button, and that's gonna bring up the context window for it. I, for example, use reminders a lot. I even prefer it over Notion or other reminder apps. So for me, this feature is literally a lifesaver, especially since Siri doesn't understand anything nine times out of 10. So you have to fix the reminder she made manually anyway. Now you can just create a quick reminder from anywhere. The autofill has also improved, one-time passcodes are now also being pulled from the mail app to not just your messages, but you have to be using your Apple ID email for this feature to work, unfortunately. If your code gets delivered to another email address other than the one tied to your Apple ID, for some reason it won't pick it up, but I'm hoping this will get fixed by September. And the same goes for the wallet app iOS now scans shipping emails and creates live orders, tracking links and push updates inside your wallet app, though again, only from the email that's linked to your Apple ID. Also, you can now set any MP3 file as your ringtone if it's under 30 seconds. So you don't need a computer with iTunes anymore. Apple finally realized it's 2025 outside. And while we're in the Files app, you can now set an app for specific file types to always open in, just like on Mac. That was most of the new features, but you have probably noticed the glass panels that are sliding underneath every menu. iOS 26 has got a complete redesign. Everything is now supposed to be glassy, though it seems Apple can't really decide how much of it should actually be glassy, because they keep changing it. So far, they've only made it less and less transparent, but I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back to glass in the next update. Besides the glassy UI, it's also got a lot more useful and compact, giving you more screen real estate. Like for example how the search bar in Safari shrinks, or how the options now expand and hide when you don't need them. So effectively, you get more space on the screen without losing functionality. Overall, the design is gorgeous in my opinion. It does create a sense of something new, despite mostly having stayed the same, or familiar I should say, because I think that's what Apple was aiming for. It just needs a bit of tweaking of the blur and maybe the clear icon. So, should you install it? Well, the performance with the public beta has improved quite a lot. It's pretty much just as good as an iOS 18. Animations are smooth, the phone feels fast, and most importantly, it doesn't overheat. Even the battery life is good. It's pretty comparable with iOS 18, but I do have the adaptive battery power mod on, which probably evens things out. But nevertheless, it lasts a decent amount. Though I have to say that ever since I've upgraded to the beta, I've lost 4% of battery health, which might just be a recalibration happening, but most likely it's the effect of the beta, so your mileage may vary. Overall, I'd say it's safe to update. Even if you have an iPhone 11, you won't encounter any serious issues with the battery and performance. Some apps might not work though, like Dehancer stopped working for me once I updated to the beta, but all my banking and messaging apps have been working completely fine, so again, your mileage may vary. That said, if you like the new design and want your iPhone to feel fresh again, there's nothing holding you back from upgrading. But like with every major update, having a backup before installing it is a must.